Welcome to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Manning, and I kissed the Duchess. Joining me is Liz, who has a parasocial relationship with the Prince. Just because I'm on a podcast, he feels like he knows me. Our book this month is Monstrous Regiment, or as I like to call it, Mulan, Oops All Lesbians Edition. (laughs) Yeah, that seems pretty accurate. I mean, based on the title alone, I definitely thought it was going to be like, oh, okay, it's going to be the watch and something about monsters or similar stuff with another maybe military or police sort of group. And on that regard, I was dead on. But everything else, I had like no idea. Funnily enough, I had actually heard about this specific novel before I learned about the series. And it was one of the first Discworld books I ever read rereading it for the podcast, I appreciated it a lot more this time. Uh, partially because they just had a better grasp on the world and characters, but also because I didn't have to spend as much time just figuring out what was <laughs> happening. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, I think this is a really great book as a an intro to Discworld, uh, because it doesn't necessarily touch on a lot of things that a lot of the other books do. But it still, like, has those threads that having the context for would definitely, like, help flesh out. Let's dive right into it with the trivia section. Published September 2003 and coming in at 101,000 words, Monstrous Regiment is the 31st Discworld novel and sixth standalone story. The title comes from the essay, The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women, written by the preacher John Knox as an argument against female monarchs. The original cover art, illustrated by Paul Kidby, parodies the photograph Raising the Flag on Iwo Jima. The main character's name and alias are a reference to the folk song Sweet Polly Oliver, which is one of several real songs referenced in the text. The name for the country of Borogravia is a reference to the Borogroves. Borogoves? The name for the country of Borogravia is a reference to the Borogoves mentioned in the Lewis Carroll poem Jabberwocky while the neighboring country of Slovenia is derived from the real country of Slovenia. The newspaper cartoonist Fizz, F-I-Z-Z, is a reference to Hablot Knight Brown, an illustrator who used the pseudonym Fizz, P-H-I-Z. The regiment's nickname, the Ins and Outs, is derived from that of the Ups and Downs, officially named the 69th Foot. And a running joke throughout the story is that most of the soldiers' names are articles of women's clothing, although that is justified in-universe as things getting named after military heroes. Stephen Briggs published a stage version of the story in 2004, although there was a separate adaptation by Chris Hainsworth, which premiered at Chicago's Lifeline Theater in July 2014. The audiobook, read by Briggs, lasts 11 hours and 38 minutes, with an abridged version read by Tony Robinson coming in at five hours. Monstrous Regiment was nominated for the 2004 Locus Award for Fantasy, the 2005 James Tiptree Jr. Memorial Award, and the 2004 Audio Award for Unabridged Fiction. Our story takes place in the deeply conservative, highly religious, and thoroughly militarized nation of Tennessee. No, uh, sorry, that's Borough <laughs> Grevia, where the young Polly Perks runs away from home to join the army. Polly's actual goal is to find her brother, Paul, who joined a year ago. If Paul doesn't return, the misogynistic loss of the land will mean that the family tavern, Polly's home and passion, will become the property of a drunkard cousin. What did you think about Polly as a character? I really liked her. She has a very distinct feel, um, I think, in both the Discworld and characters in general. Um, And... Though it's less obvious at the start, I do appreciate her general, like, ambiguity on things and her ability to see the nuance and complexities of things and not necessarily, like, be like, this is right and this is wrong and this is what I'm doing. There's definitely some similarities to other Discworld protagonists we've had, especially the a lot of the female protagonists tend to be, like, that sort of headstrong and capable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like Polly, to some extent, though... And it, maybe it's the tone of the book in general. It just feels like she's coming from a, a bit of a more complicated background. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just got a, a bit of extra depth to her, I think. Also, about her brother, Paul. We learn very little about him since he's mainly just like a MacGuffin. But he's 
I think definitely coded as autistic with a special interest in birds. Yeah, I think that's spot on. What's our motto? <laughs> there are no neurotypical characters in Discworld. <laughs> <laughs> So disguising herself as a boy, Polly finds the recruiting band, meeting the snidely Corporal Strappy and the boisterous Sergeant Jackram. I appreciate how little Strappy's in this book, because I do not <laughs> like him. Yeah, he's a pill. Yeah, and he's not even like a fun antagonist. He just gets on my nerves. <laughs> Jackram is interesting. I'm not a huge fan of the fat jokes that are made. No, and I think that's a weak spot for Discworld in general. Not a lot of yeah. sympathy is shown to characters who are who are heavy. Yeah. From there, we cut to the fortress of Neck Keep, the great military stronghold of Borogravia. The keep has been taken by an alliance of the country's many enemies, and is now under the command of Sir Samuel Vimes, the Duke of Ankh-Morpork. As he consults with the Morporkian ambassador to Borogravia, Vimes is obviously exhausted by the problem of a nation ruled by three things. A dead duchess, a hateful religion, and an insatiable hunger for war. As much as I love the watchbooks in general and Vimes as a character, I am very glad that he is not in this book more. Yeah. Because I feel like it would have taken so much away from Polly's and the other characters' growth throughout the book. Yeah. And, like, ultimately, this is not a Vimes story. This is Polly's story, and mm -hmm. he's just in it. Yeah, so it's like the background character he is here, perfect. I mentioned that this was one of the first Discworld books I read. I had no idea who this character was the first time. <laughs> yeah, you're like, they're acting like this guy is kind of important, but yeah. I don't know who he is. <laughs> I think actually somehow I accidentally skipped over all of his scenes. So like he just came in at the end for me. <laughs> You're like, who is this guy? Well, they wanted to talk about this book is saturated with references to previous Discworld novels. But I don't mm -hmm. think they, they interrupt the story. Yeah, I think the special thing about this book is because obviously politics and history and country relations are very important to what's happening and essentially kind of in the background. So we need to understand a little bit of those things to know what the conflict is with Borogravia in the first place. But because the entire plot is not necessarily contingent on understanding all of the major parties in this war, you don't need to be like an expert in it at all. Back with Polly, she's not the only new recruit. Uh, they are joined by the vampire Maledict, the troll Carborundum, the Igor, Igor, and four other humans, Lofty, Tonker, Shefty, and Wazer. I have no idea <laughs> how many of the names are like references, but Tonker is uh, uh, anatomical in nature. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that seems appropriate for a, a, a group of young men. Early the next morning, Polly goes to the latrine, where a mysterious voice in the next stall advises her to stick a pair of socks down her trousers to help her pass as a boy. Polly wonders about her mysterious benefactor, even as their field training begins. This is probably my favorite, like, running joke throughout the book, is all the characters to start to talk about uh, thinking with their socks or acting with <laughs> their socks. Yeah, and I... <laughs> I very much enjoy the line, she kicked him right in the sock drawer for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of a great uh, innuendos in there with this one. Yeah. The squad marches through a river of refugees toward the barracks. Along the way, Polly accidentally runs into Lofty while both of them are relieving themselves in the bushes, and Polly realizes that the other recruit is also a girl, presumably following her boyfriend, since she and Tonker seem to be joined at the hip. Funnily enough, Lofty's goal in that case would be very similar to the song Sweet Polly Oliver. <laughs> when this was revealed, did you figure out where the book was going? Yeah, I definitely was starting to be like, okay, I get it. Everybody's got like a thing going on. I didn't necessarily think it was all going to be like the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> when the squad reaches the barracks, they meet their new commanding officer, Lieutenant Blouse. And he reveals that all of them are heading for the front that very night. I think what this book does really well is it really captures the sense of hopelessness and dread that's associated with a lot of war. And 
I when I was in college, I took a thing that focused a lot on uh, the poetry from World War One, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of it tonally like very much mirrors the first part of this book, which I really appreciated because, especially considering how young all of the new recruits seem, it feels very appropriate to be like this country is just sending them off to die and it doesn't care about them at all. Yeah. So, the recruits are also introduced to the Quartermaster, three parts, so-called because he's a triple amputee. It's obvious that Borogrivia is losing the war, but none of the officers will admit it. Uh, that does speak to what you were saying about the hopelessness. Yeah, and I think all of the officers and really everybody in general being so insistent that they are winning does a lot to communicate where Borogrivia has been as a country and how much that's impacted all of the people who live within it. Yeah. Private Shufti volunteers to cook dinner that night, but a disagreement with three parts about the best application of cooking sherry gives her true gender away. Polly finds a moment alone with her, and it's revealed that Shufti joined the army to find the man who might be generously called her fiancé. An urgent quest, since she's pregnant. That's something I definitely wasn't expecting the, f- the first time I read this one. Yeah, that definitely comes out of nowhere. And especially it sets up Shifty as this kind of naive, hopeless, romantic kind of character. And that compared against the like darkness of the background really does a lot to be like, oh no, like they are all in way over their heads right now. Yeah, I do think that that speaks to the environment in which she was raised. Mm -hmm. Because it's made clear that the religion of the land, Nuganism, is a very patriarchal and kind of reduces women to property of men. Yeah. Her going after the boy who impregnated her is just like, she doesn't know how else to deal with this situation. And especially, and this is obviously part of the joke, is uh, the description she gives of the, her fella seems very, like, stereotypical. Like, it'd be out of a folk song or whatever. So it seems like, uh no, this dude, like, lied to her and left her. That night... A group of enemy soldiers enter the barracks town, and Polly distracts them by disguising herself as a barmaid. Their leader begins to make a move on Polly, but she ends up kneeing him in the groin and escaping. (laughs) Yeah, this entire scene is a nice bit of tension and action. Definitely. Sergeant Jackram and the recruits manage to tie up the soldiers and briefly interrogate them before stealing their boots. At this point, they are interrupted by the arrival of William de Word and Otto Shriek of the Ankh-Morpork Times, who are here reporting on and photographing the war, respectively. I would not have expected in, like, a million years that those two would have popped up in this book, and then the second they did, I was like, oh, well, obviously, huh? <laughs> and again, it also doesn't feel like a William de Word story. It feels like a Bali story. Mm-hmm. After waking up the oblivious Lieutenant Blouse, the squad presses on towards the front lines. Polly isn't the only one who has figured out that most of the recruits are girls. Malik's acute vampire senses mean that he's spotted them as well, and he tells Polly that that category includes Tonker, although she was correct that Tonker and Lofty are romantically involved. That was something I definitely wasn't expecting. Like, granted, I haven't necessarily read a lot of fiction predating when I got into middle school. And at that time, there wasn't necessarily a lot of queer relationships in the fiction I was reading. So I kind of just had an expectation that that wasn't really a thing in, like, mainstream genre fiction. So to see that here, it was like... I don't know, it made this book feel like it could have been published yesterday for me, really. (laughs) Yeah, which on the one hand is kind of an indictment of how long it's taken (laughs) us to get to this point, but also just like, like, this was 2003, almost two decades ago. Yeah, like, it seems very modern and fresh, even considering its age. So I also could have sworn there was a good line in here when Polly learned about Lofty and and Tonker and the narration saying something like, and the world grew a little wider for Polly. But it looks like I was just misremembering a line Maledict had about the world unfolding for her, which is fine, but it wasn't quite the same. Yeah, there's definitely like a a connotation thing in there that's slightly different between the two. The version I remembered could have been read as Polly having a gay awakening. (laughs) (laughs) Which I do approve of that version. 
At this point, the recruits come together and basically admit that they're all women. In fact, Lofty, Tonker, and Wazer all escaped from the Girls' Working School, an institution for young women who fail to follow the commandments of the god Nuggan. Tonker mentions that she and Lofty are planning to go back there in the summer so that they can burn it down. And you know what? I support that. Th- I support that for them. <laughs> the way that the two queer characters that have been like explicitly introduced so far are like mentally unstable is not great. No, I guess I do appreciate that. You know, their relationship is very sturdy. You know, like I wasn't expecting something to happen to one of them at the end of this book or something. You know? Yeah. It's more like. This place is a bad thing, and it's hurt a lot of people, and it got away with hurting a lot of people because of this messed up religion that they all follow, and that's a bad thing, but them being together is not the bad thing. Yeah. Lofty's pyromania is not demonized in the text, so that's Mm -hmm. interesting. It's more nuanced than I might have expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I think especially at where we are in time... In regards to representation of non-heterosexual characters, I think, and granted, I know this book was published like almost 20 years ago, but I think it's okay to take some things where, you know, maybe this character isn't so great on these, in these fronts, but it does really well on these ones. So, you know, it's nuanced and it's appreciated for what it is and it doesn't need to be like the end all be all of perfect representation and perfect's in air quotes there. Yeah. Might as well also talk a little bit about uh, Nuggan, who was actually a very minor character in a previous story. Yeah, it was the last hero, wasn't it? Ding, ding, ding. That's what I thought. I was like, this name seems familiar, but I feel like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was one of the gods in Dun Manifestin, who was like mm-hmm. talking about how he had banned a bunch of things. Oh, yeah. You see that that's all that's left of him, because Nuggan has died the way that gods do on the Discworld. It's just people stopped believing in him, and he mm-hmm. withered away. But, like, what's interesting is that the religious text is still getting updated through the magic of three ring binders. <laughs> it's functional, you know? About now, it comes to light that Maledict's coffee machine has been destroyed and the beans were stolen. It seems that Corporal Strappy deserted rather than face real combat, and he went through all the squad's belongings for things to sabotage or steal. The lack of coffee is a serious problem because Maledict uses it as a displacement for the urge to drink blood. Something that this book does really well is that it forces you to adjust your perception of characters multiple times throughout the book. And I think with Corporal Strappy, you know, he seems like, oh, he's this big, strong military hero. He's a patriot, you know, do anything for his country. And then, you know, they're at that precipice of going to war and he vanishes. You know, it's very clearly that that was all bravado and he's a coward. Um, And not only was he a coward, he was a spiteful one who wanted to hurt all of these Basically, like, teenagers? I respectfully disagree. I thought he was a tool Mm -hmm. all the way through. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, you always seemed like a... uh, I'm trying to figure out a non-swear word version of what I want to say. (laughs) But he at least seemed, like, a little more genuine in how he portrayed himself and his relationship to his country. But ultimately, all of that was false. I also just want to talk a little bit about Maledict as well. During the uh, meeting that the recruits have, Maledict is the only one that doesn't confirm their gender. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's, I guess, ambiguous enough. We might as well just spoil now that he is a woman in disguise. Mm -hmm. Just like the rest of them. But, like, it's left ambiguous. Actually, uh, I think also... Igor does not confirm. Yeah, during this scene, I think Polly kind of like, she like raises an eyebrow at Maledict or something. And Maledict just like does not answer her. She she just kind of gives like Polly like a teasing smile or something. I'm going to keep referring to Maledict as Maledict throughout the podcast. Yeah. (laughs) For the sake of clarity, because that's how they are referred to throughout the whole narrative. Yeah, this book is kind of... 
extremely complicated for learning and keeping track of everybody's names. I actually put in a spreadsheet in the notes section, <laughs> yeah. which you can find if you support us on patreon.com slash weird sisters podcast. Yeah, like three or four times in this book, I did have to like refresh my memory on who was who because their name changed or I just got them mixed up with each other. And then I was at the end of the book and I was like, I don't even remember if what I thought was correct at this point. <laughs> Yeah, that is, I think, probably the biggest weakness of this story from a reader's perspective. Yeah, because you really do need, like, a table to keep track of everything and reference as you get to each character. Especially those ones whose names are similar to each other, like Strappy and Shufty. Oh, yeah. Wazer and Ozer, like, threw me off for a good third of the book, I think. Yeah. And one of them's the main character. <laughs> Yeah, also just Maledict's thing with the being a League of Temperance vampire, so having sworn off of drinking blood. I enjoy how he, air quotes, refers to it as a vampire officially pretending to not be one. Mm -hmm. By putting that out in the open, like, it does leave it at least a little bit ambiguous if they're cross-dressing as well. Yeah, I mean, I really, really like Maledict as a character in general. She's a lot of fun. She and Polly together are really interesting and always very fun. And I appreciate that ambiguity because it kind of seems like as the book's starting up that a lot, a large part of the book is them kind of discovering that they're all girls. And then that's out of the way, like a third or a quarter of the way into the book. And so then it's just maledict and you don't know. And then it's kind of like, does it matter if you know or not? Because this book starts out as being about a girl disguising herself as a boy and is then revealed to be about a bunch of girls disguising themselves as boys and then reveals itself to be about something a little bit larger than that. We'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> Around here is where the squad finds a ransacked cottage where a charcoal burner and his wife were killed by deserters. Private Wazer insists on burying them along with a prayer to the Duchess. Wazer is more religious than anyone Polly knows and that fanaticism worries her. Yeah, I appreciate that even though all of... The recruits are obviously on the same team, that they aren't necessarily, you know, all on the same page as what that means for them. They know they're all ultimately working for the same end goal, which is fighting for Borogravia, but like how and what that means to them does differ. And there's some tension between them all regarding that. They're mostly fighting for themselves more than anything. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just under the guise of doing it for their country that ultimately falls away pretty quickly. That night, the squad ambushes a group of enemy spies. During the interrogation, one of them reveals that the officer whom Polly kicked in the junk was actually Prince Heinrich, the leader of the country that is trying to conquer Borgrivia. As the prisoner tries to escape, Sergeant Jackram kills him. Polly is under a lot of stress. This war is not going well for her. Yeah, they, the, they have not had a whole lot of wins up to this point. I mean, they have had a big win, and that has proven to be a source of new problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, later on, they run across the reporters again, and Otto mentions to Polly that Maledict's withdrawal is causing flash sides, which are like flashbacks but to parallel universes, in this case to the Vietnam War. Slightly weird. Yeah, it's pretty clear that a lot of these flash slides are ultimately kind of references to Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. Like there's um, ways that the like scenes are described that I'm pretty sure are just like descriptions of shots from that movie. I am not certain of that. I've never seen it. <laughs> I've just heard it talked about a lot. So I know some stuff through osmosis. It's one of those things that just gets referenced so often that like probably going back and seeing it you're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's where all that's coming from. <laughs> I yeah. now feel like I understand a solid third of the jokes from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Like, I think in Monstrous Regiment, during one of Maledict's flash sides, Polly, or maybe I'm getting some things mixed up. I thought it was, like, something along the Flight of the Valkyries, but now I'm not so sure about that. So <laughs> There's definitely reference to helicopters. Yeah, I think I might be combining some things in my head. I feel like I would enjoy the flash sides a little bit more if they were woven into the plot a little better. Yeah, Maledict losing the coffee beans uh, does a lot for the plot, especially with, you know, recontextualizing characters because Maledict becomes somebody who Polly and we see as a friend to being seen as somebody who could be a real threat 
and how are they going to deal with that threat? But, you know, the in-betweens of that do get a little a little messy. Polly also observes Sergeant Jackram's ability to manipulate authority figures by pretending to be a simple soldier, as he tells William DeWord about how impressive Lieutenant Blouse has been. William, in turn, tells Blouse about how badly the war is going. Much of the army and almost all of the high command is imprisoned in Neck Keep. The rest of the army is being slaughtered, and the only reason the war hasn't ended is Borogravia refuses to surrender. However, thanks to the newspaper... This small squad has captured the interest of the world. Yeah, this seems to relate back to a running thread through all the Discworld books where stories have power. Absolutely. Which feels very appropriate because, you know, a lot of a lot of military struggles do ultimately rely on some amount of controlling and manipulating the information that gets out to the general public and how that can be used. One particular individual interested in the so-called monstrous regiment is Sam Vimes as we see that he has two of his officers tailing the squad, although his motive remains a mystery. But soon enough, he arranges for Maledict to receive a bag of roasted coffee grounds, rendering the vampire almost comatose with relief. Yeah, I appreciate the, that the book did not ultimately make Maledict a, a threat that they needed to take care of. <laughs> although Igorina is ready to do so. I appreciated mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's very in character for the Igors in general to just be like, nope, there's a job that needs to be done and I will do it. Yeah. Also, I'm not really clear why there has to be sexism among the Igors. Yeah, it seems like kind of a thing invented for this book. You know, we've heard about the Igors before, but it makes it kind of seem like, no, you are an Igor and Igors are desirable partners and Igors are good at their job. And so it's like, well, why are they adding this whole layer of like weirdness in there? It's like, aren't they just about doing a job and serving a, serving people? I would hazard a guess that it's to reflect that level of education is not indicative of wisdom. Right. It's possible for a group of people to be very capable and like scientifically knowledgeable, but still sexist. Yeah. Okay, I think that makes a lot of sense. Eventually, the squad makes it to Neck Keep, where they realize the best way inside is in disguise as washerwomen. To the surprise of all the recruits, Lieutenant Blouse volunteers for the job, citing his experience as an actor back at his all-boys boarding school. <laughs> hey, Liz. Do you know who I would cast as Lieutenant Blouse? <laughs> no, who? Hugo Weaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, just to finish off that running joke. <laughs> I was like, there has to be a pun in here somewhere. <laughs> Sometime after Blouse drags himself into the keep, the recruits decide to follow suit revealing their true identities to Sergeant Jackram as a means of persuading him. Eventually, he agrees to assist, and they acquire more women's clothing from a brothel set up in the Borogravian army's camp. Um, as they're entering the camp, Polly's describing how she didn't expect there to be so many people, like it's like a little city. You know, it's full of women and children, all these people that she wouldn't expect to be at a battlefield. And I appreciate that, because, uh, you know, wars are big operations and you know it takes a lot of people to support something like that which does mean that you're not going to just have a bunch of soldiers sitting in some field somewhere getting ready to go to war i mean this definitely does feel like a real thing i haven't done too much research on it but like terry pratchett probably would have yeah it, it just feels more true to life than necessarily a lot of depictions of war in media do also, yeah, with the persuading Sergeant Jackram bit, we finally get to do the whole, all the team, like, decide to do a thing, and the one last person who needs persuading finally agrees. Trope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Carborundum, aka Jade, stays behind to keep an eye on Maledict as the recruits make their way into the keep, where they are immediately identified as soldiers in disguise. But Shufti reveals her... Anatomy to the guard, and they are accepted. This seems a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know exactly how I feel about it. You know, also just like, a lot of attention in the fandom gets focused on Maledicta, but Shafti is great. I like her. Yeah, I really like how, and I don't necessarily know if it's ne necessarily Shifty's character that grows over the course of the book, or if it's Polly's understanding of her, but 
I really appreciate that the relationship that her and Polly ultimately grow to have, you know? Once inside, Polly is astonished to find that Lieutenant Blouse actually had no trouble fooling the guards. The <laughs> actual washerwoman figured him out, but he's so good at ironing that they look the other way. <laughs> you know, that works. Yeah, it kind of plays into a, a running joke in the series that like things that try to look like things often look more like things than things that are things. <laughs> yeah. Also, Blouse doesn't actually look like a woman if we are to believe Polly's description of his acting. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a dark in there where, where the guards are. Reunited with their commanding officer, Polly, Tonker, Lofty, Igorina, and Wazer make their way through the keep. However, Tonker's frustration with Wazer's piety and Blouse's condescension causes her to explode in anger, giving them away to the guards. The squad is imprisoned in a kitchen, where Lofty uses her skill with fire to create a flower bomb. They free the imprisoned members of the army, who immediately seize authority, attacking the enemy soldiers and locking the squad in an old guard room. Yeah, I like that this is not the scene where suddenly, you know, the characters who've been falling somehow turn out to be the big heroes who save the day and win the battle for everything, you know. It's, they do a thing and everybody else, like, acts on instinct or something then they're just kind of like waiting and till uh, everybody decides that hey a bunch of girls shouldn't do this yeah but also like this story is ultimately not resolved through combat which i definitely think is strong yeah like it's about a war but it's not about you know the war as the Borogravian soldiers fight for control of the keep the high command convenes an impromptu tribunal to determine what to do with the squad. And who should be there but Corporal Strappy, revealed to actually be a captain in the Borogravian equivalent of the NSA. Uh, this part is somewhat confusing, but interesting, because it's kind of the culmination of the cognitive dissonance that is eating away at the country. Uh, the High Command want the whole situation to be resolved quickly and quietly, but the squad are all e heroes with international notoriety. Yeah, like... It's very clear that the politics of the situation are far messier than anybody involved want them to be. But also, like, the squad refused to accept, like, being, like, paid to go away, basically. Yeah, and I really appreciate that because they've basically run away from their old lives where they were just doing what they needed to do. And now they're like, hey, no, we did a good thing. and It's not fair that you just try to, like, hide us away because of it. They're owed some dues. To help the squad get those dues, Sergeant Jackram arrives and calls in the many favors that he's accumulated over a long career, not the least of which is knowing that a full third of the High Command are women in disguise. Yeah, that's definitely not a thing I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it started, though, it was like, obviously. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, I see where this is going. At this point, the Duchess herself appears channeling her spirit through Wazer. She implores the High Command to end the war and to dissolve the religion. The god Nugan is dead, and so is she, but the prayers of the people have trapped her halfway between oblivion and divinity, and it's torture. So, for one, she goes full post-credits to Ferris Bueller's day off here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing I want to mention... Uh, for those like me who aren't super familiar with war movies, there's apparently a trope where a soldier will be super religious and then lose faith when confronted with the horrors of war. I think we're supposed to expect that to be Wazer's character arc, but it's really more of a Joan of arc. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's uh, a really good way to put it, especially because it seems like all the characters in the book are treating her like she's going to be the former. And then it turns out, actually, no, she has been talking to the Duchess this entire time, you know, like to an actual god almost. That's a, definitely a cool twist I was not expecting. So, with much of the High Command persuaded, it's time to end the war. Polly is sent to meet with Sir Samuel Vines. Together, they arrange a truce that will let Borogravia keep its life and its dignity. And Vines, to Polly's joy and relief, returns her brother to her. Yeah, the scene where Polly sees her brother again, it's very short. But it was just, it felt so euphoric and, like, made me tearful. 
you know, about this character that we hardly know anything about just because Polly was obviously so relieved to see him. And he says something where he's like drawing pictures of birds. It's so sweet and meaningful and it's obvious how much that means to Polly. Yeah, because we didn't talk about it in the summary, but Polly like, has a lot of complicated feelings around her family and everything because she acquired for Paul a box of paints so that he could make drawings of birds, and their mother destroyed the painting, and that made Polly lose faith in the religion and everything. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that uh, the outside world lets Paul embrace that thing that he loves, it's like, if she wasn't already persuaded that the war should end, this definitely does the job. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very representative of, especially, you know, how birds are often equated with freedom in media. Mm. Um, that, you know, Polly seeing Paul with, you know, even though it's a fake bird, is ultimately like she's getting a taste of the freedom that exists or could exist in the outside world. Of course, Ankh-Mor Park isn't the country that they're fighting, but, like, it's the, like, political powerhouse of the region. But, like, that truce being with Ankh-Mor Park leads to the ending, which we'll come to in a minute. Yeah. Before she can head home, Polly has a talk with Sergeant Jackram and confirms what she had suspected for a while. Jackram was a sign female at birth uh, that joined the army to follow a man and lost him in combat many years ago. They had a son who is a respected blacksmith, but the sergeant has been living as a man for so long that the prospect of losing that identity is terrifying. So instead, Polly suggests that Jackram just continue with his identity. Yeah, I appreciate that, you know, considering that a lot of characters who are originally presented as male in this book um, are then revealed to not have always been male. It's not that they all just come out and embrace their womanhood and femininity and you know rejoin the world like that like the recruits obviously do because that's a thing they've been living with for a much shorter amount of time but the high command and jackram like they're all much more comfortable as men at that point and want to continue being that way and aren't gonna be outed to the world for being anything other than the way that they've chose to present themselves to it yeah I think there's an element of political agency in that as well, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not the entire army, and most of the rest of the officers don't know about this because they were either away or like, sent out of the room. It's nuanced, definitely. I want to point out the narration does use she, her pronouns for Jackram after the reveal, but I don't know that that's accurate. Yeah, I don't think so. I pretty much just read this as Sergeant Jackram being a trans man. Yeah, I think I, I think that's right. Like, he obviously, you know, has been presenting as a man for a very long time and was in a relationship with another man essentially while presenting as a man and doesn't feel comfortable giving that up to potentially pursue a relationship with his son, you know? Like, he expresses a lot of discomfort at, he says he doesn't want to be an old fitty, you know? Like, it's very obvious that that's not a comfortable position for him. Yeah. One thing I was also thinking about was if Sergeant Jackram like deliberately cultivated body fat uh, as a way to hide breast tissue. Mm -hmm. I think that would make a lot of sense, especially since he says that, you know, when he was younger and the place he uh, grew up in, that the thing you would look for in a woman is if they could carry a pig underneath each arm. Yeah. And so then being heavy set, uh, which might be a thing that Jackram's body would naturally lean towards anyways, you know, bulking that out a little bit might make that a lot easier to conceal. Yeah, Borogravia is repeatedly mentioned to be a mountainous region, so heartiness is definitely a an evolutionary advantage. Yeah, for sure. As Borogravia's perpetual war starts to wind down, the monstrous regiment are lauded as heroes. The military finds Shafti, the boy that she was looking for, and she flat out rejects him. Good for her. A uh, Wazer joins the general's household. A uh, Jade wanders off with a handsome young troll. Igorina opens a gynecology clinic. And Lofty and Tonker embark on a romantic life of crime. <laughs> As for Polly, she returns home with Paul and Shufti in tow. However, it seems the peace won't last. And Prince Heinrich is undoubtedly seeking revenge. Polly is ambivalent about returning to the army. 
they're allowing women to join openly now, but as little more than glorified mascots. Then she receives a package from Chakram with his old swords and a book full of information about the soldiers he helped along the way. With that, Polly heads out, joining Maledicta and a couple new recruits to serve their country the way it needs to be saved. Yeah, I really like the ending of the book because I think a lot of fiction tends to lean towards, oh, these heroes won the war and everything's good. And it kind of seems like it's leaning that way until Heinrich starts getting up to some funny business. And it becomes very clear that you know, the on- the world only gets better when you work to make it better. You know, it's not like you just do a single thing and everything's fixed and you live happily ever after. It's a constant effort to make sure things get better. I'll say, like, that the whole trying to change the system from within is uh, lauded a bit more than I think it bears out in real life. But, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't tend to work that well in reality. But... You know, this is a fantasy novel. Yeah, so it's naturally things are going to get, like, hand-waved a little bit. Oh, and in case it wasn't clear, the new recruits are also women joining as men. So, that was Monstrous Regiment. What did you think? I really, really liked this book. I, The tone at the beginning was so interesting because it felt very, um, like I said, dark and very true to how war is depicted. And then the characters are a lot of fun and... It just, it goes in so many places that starting off the book, I had no idea where it was going to end. Like my first guess was definitely wrong. So I think this is a really great book. I think it's definitely worth giving a chance if you have not read it already. I agree. I agree. So uh, some general discussion points. So this is relatively timely. Apparently it's been a recent thing that a number of transphobes have tried to say that Terry Pratchett would be on their side of discussions. Uh, In light of this story, what do you think about that, Liz? I don't think those people have read a lot of Discworld. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm not sure where they could possibly be getting that perspective from. A lot of the earlier stories, especially, were a little bit more politically, like, centrist. So they Mm -hmm. could be interpreted, they could maybe be interpreted by conservative folks as being on their side. But, like, no, my dudes. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it seems like they're missing a lot of what makes the Discworld characters themselves, you know? Like, even... Yeah, like, even not outside of the context of this book, like, I'm not sure how, like, where you could possibly, like, get an understanding that Terry Pratchett would somehow be a turf in the year of our Lord 2021. Like, if this book had a subtitle, it would basically just be Gender is Performance. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that's spot on. <laughs> Somewhat relatedly, one just, like, structural thing I think was a little off. Uh, There's one character, Major Clogston, who gets introduced, like, just before the tribunal and basically acts as the defense attorney for the squad and then later outs themselves as being signed female. Just their position of introduction felt weird to me. Yeah, uh, when I was reading it and Clogston is introduced, I definitely thought it was going to be, okay, they're there for the scene, and then they'll never come up and back in the book. And then when Clogston is there later, essentially for the rest of the book, I was like, okay, I feel like I did not offer this character enough importance. <laughs> yeah. If I was put in charge of adapting this story, I might do something like combine them with the ambassador character whom Vimes talks to early on and is never seen again. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe the major is, like, the ambassador to Ankh Morpork or something? Just spitballing. Yeah, I mean, I think that would work really well from an adaptational sense, because then you're condensing two bit parts into one, one part that's slightly more important. Yeah. And then we get to know this character far earlier than the ending of the book. Point of order here, just a little bit of bookkeeping. Uh, so Polly does gaslight and girl boss the army, but she does not... <laughs> meaningfully gatekeep so no credit there however lieutenant blouse does in fact manipulate the enemy signaling system mansplain acting feminine to the squad (laughs) and acts as a male wife to the washerwoman wait (laughs) getting confirmation from the judges yes that is full points (laughs) (laughs) applause in the background (laughs) 
unrelated to that, <laughs> there's a very minor subplot about the zombies in Neck Keep, and I don't think it got as much payoff as it deserved. It was there, and then it was not relevant. Mm -hmm. If you'll indulge me in a bit of fan fiction, what if they had brought the zombies to the tribunal so that when Wasser channeled the Duchess, these famous dead soldiers could vouch for her and maybe show support for social reform? Like, that mm -hmm. could have been interesting. Yeah, like, that'd be really, really cool, especially since it would definitely increase how m magical and supernatural Wazer seems at the tribunal and really sell it that it's like, oh, this is not just, like, some young woman or whatever um taking command it's like nah there's some real magic going on here there's some real religion going on here <laughs> yeah it could have been really interesting especially if there had been like an element of people saying stuff along the lines of what would x historical figure have thought if they could see what's happening today and that person coming back and deciding that they were wrong when they were alive mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a really interesting idea. And especially since I feel like part of revealing that a por portion of the high command um, were uh, assigned female birth, like were part of why that was in the story is because it shows that, you know, it's not like suddenly a bunch of girls decided to join the army and save the world or whatever. It's no, this has always been a thing that's been done. Just things happened differently this time. So if you could do that with some old zombie war heroes and be like, nah, the world's always been this way. It's just changing how we understand it. Yeah. First of a couple points, I want to talk briefly about allegory, and I hope you'll forgive me if I'm retreading old ground here. It's tempting to speculate about Borogravia as representing a specific country or people. There's fan circulation on a couple wikis that compare it to Austria and the Balkans with its long history of fighting its neighbors, while the divine prohibitions have been compared to Islam. Personally, I want to point out that the description warmongering nation with a confining religion is also true of Britain and the US. <laughs> yeah. But that's secondary to the real point, which is that I don't think this is meant to be a standard for a real place. It's about a mindset, an idea that there is a correct way to be and that all deviation from that order must be punished. And more than that, it's about demonstrating how the victims of an unjust system will perpetuate it out of fear. The judgmental old ladies are much the same as the distinguished high command, all of them looking for scapegoats to distract people from their own shortcomings and to grasp at eat a way to affect the world. Yeah, I think that's totally spot on. I think, you know, where a lot of readers, I know myself included, um, fall short with interacting with media is that we interpret we want to interpret things far more literally than they're intended to be because you know there's that old-timey joke about why did the author make the curtains blue and the student says because the author wanted the curtains to be blue but a lot of the time it is far more complex than that you know it's and a lot of it's not necessarily even explicit from like it's not even necessarily intentional from the author I know a lot of things I've written were then after sitting with it for months, I've realized, oh, I did these things because I was kind of like working through a thing and these are all representative of the thing I was going through at that point. Yeah. And so I think, you know, trying to pick apart this kind of restrictive system or identity and how that affects the people who are forced to live within it is useful and trying to make it an explicit place is a little less so. <laughs> Yeah, saying that it's somebody feels like giving everybody else a license to not examine themselves. That's like that's not useful. Yeah, because like in this kind of context, this is not historical fiction. So what does saying X Y Z country is bad and X Y Z religion is bad ultimately do for furthering uh, the reason we read books? You know, which is 
to get entertainment and to hopefully understand something about ourselves or the world a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, Relatedly, I really appreciate how this story emphasizes oppression as primarily systemic rather than focusing on the actions of individuals. Uh, We do get examples of specific people doing stuff. Uh, uh, Strappy being a bully, Blouse's innocent misogyny, and Prince Heinrich trying to force himself on Polly. But the narrative makes it clear that the root problem isn't those who say yes to injustice, it's those who decline to say no. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Last chance for any thoughts before we go? Uh, any characters that you particularly liked and we didn't shout out? No, nah, I mean, my favorite characters are definitely Polly and Maledicta and mainly because I ship them so hard now. <laughs> yeah, I do. I love them. Apparently Terry Pratchett like, is on record saying that Maledicta returned to the army because she loves Polly. Aww. You're not alone. <laughs> it just felt very like, you know... Uh, full circle at the end that you know Polly's like no I gotta go do this thing I'm rejoining the army and leaving my life behind but this time for different reasons and then Maledict is just right there with her you know yeah it's like no we've got unfinished business they are also a very popular ship in the fandom so good yes that's correct (laughs) (laughs) although honestly I think a better relationship would be with Polly and Shufti okay or Mm -hmm. or Hear me out. Polly, Shufty, and Maledicta. Oh, <laughs> that's definitely the wild card option. <laughs> I'm totally on board with that. I think, you know, uh, Polly and Maledicta have a good rapport with each other. And pa- uh, Shufty's obviously got a very, like, compassionate, caring part of her that also, I think, is a part of Polly that, like, yes, chef kiss. <laughs> Uh, they all encourage each other to grow is the thing, right? And mm-hmm. that's, like, that's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, what more do you want from a relationship? (laughs) (laughs) So for every book, I like to suggest a thesis to distill the messages of the narrative. Now, a major theme of the book is gender as a matter of performance and how it shouldn't be used to restrict the kind of life a person can lead. But looking slightly deeper, I'd say the story is ultimately a condemnation of any restrictive social order and all who embrace it. The religion of the land is becoming nothing more than an echo chamber for the people's fears. The only government we see is the military, and the only glimpses we get of life outside the war are basically about people bullying each other because it's the only agency they can find. This is all about saying, don't be this. Yeah, and it's that, you know, being cruel and selfish only forces other people to be cruel and selfish, which then only forces other people to be cruel and selfish. And then you have this horrible feedback loop where everybody's worse off for it. Yeah, and ultimately it's a self-destructive feedback loop because, like, no human is an island, right? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Selfishness means that there's not not enough to go around. Yeah, it's not a sustainable way to live. Humanity is not a spectator sport, right? (laughs) Yeah. So, almost at the end, thank you to Willow Carter for our theme music, to my co-host here for joining me, and to everyone who's listening. If you like the show, please consider rating us on whichever service that you use to get your podcasts. Uh, Maybe leave a review or comment and share it on your preferred social media site. If you want to support us directly, you can do so on Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can help offset the cost of keeping this show going. And in return, you get previews and show notes for each episode. Plus, if we get to $200 a month, I'll start doing bonus episodes. And each time we shout out one randomly selected patron. And this month, we salute Jessica. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, Jessica. One additional thing for an upcoming episode, I'd like to do a mailbag. So if you have any questions, please email us at weirdsisterspodcast at gmail.com or shoot us a message on any of our social media accounts. If need be, we may I may partition the questions to different members of the crew. So if you have a question that's specific to either me or Liz, just mention it and just in the body of the text. I can't promise any of our past guests will be able to join in, so I advise against writing for them unless you have something really interesting to ask. <laughs> and like, just sign it however you want to be addressed on air. And of course, we like to round out each episode with our audience's vote for the favorite footnote. It's hard to be an ornithologist and walk through a wood when all around you the world is shouting, Bugger off, this is my bush. Are the nest thief. Have sex with me. I can make my chest big and red. <laughs> Join us again next month for A Hat Full of Sky. Until then, the, the turtle, turtle moves. moves. <laughs>